Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community, from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning, Summit. How are you? Man, it's good to be here. And I want to say, I want to echo what Jake said. Man, I miss you. I miss you. Um, I was praying for you yesterday and um, was just thinking about, the, you know, the last couple of weeks is like being dropped off in a jungle. And uh, we're, it's like we've been dropped off in a jungle in South America and and it's like over these last few weeks, we've been trying to figure out how do we get out of this thing alive without getting eaten alive. And, you know, as I was praying for you yesterday and I was just thinking through this whole process, uh, I, you know, it's imperative as I was thinking about this analogy of being dropped off in the middle of a jungle with a jungle guide, I got to get out alive. Our desire to survive really depends on whether or not we're going to listen to our God. It really depends on that. And I've said this over the last couple of weeks, is that really nothing has changed, but everything has changed. Because even a year ago, we know just as much about the future today as we knew a year ago at this time. And we are just as dependent upon God as we were a year ago when everything was normal, whatever that is, as we are today. It's just that we are so much more aware of our dependency and our lack of knowledge about the future, that we are dependent upon our God, the Holy Spirit, God. As we said last week, this is not new. We've always been in a struggle. Believers have always been in a struggle. This has been, we're, we're, we're in this together. We're the body of Christ. We're all a part of the body of Christ. And so this isn't new. Yes, circumstances have changed, but this is not new. We've always been in a battle. And we know that we have an enemy that wants to destroy us and it's much more deadly and vicious than any virus or any entity that we can come up with here on earth. It's much more vicious than that and it's personal because it goes all the way back to eternity past as we said last week. And, and we said this, that when it comes to us, the biggest play, playing field of the battle is in our minds. It's in our minds and what we think about, and, and it's one of the most crucial battles of the Christian life. And, and so we began last week to look at if we're in a battle, then what do we do? Has God given us any instructions? Has our God given us any instructions? Because if we were dropped off in the jungle in the middle of South America, he would probably tell us, hey, you need to do this, you need to do that, put this on, don't wear that, do this. And so God has given us a God of what we do in a battle. And we started looking at Ephesians chapter 6 last week. We're going to be back in there this week and next week. And, and I want us to go back there again this morning in Ephesians chapter 6. We'll begin reading in, in, in verse 10 where Paul says a final word. In other words, I'm going to leave you with the last instructions. Now that I've given you everything else, let me give you a final word because we're in a battle. And here's what he says. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil or our enemy. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece, not just one, not just a little bit, put on every piece of God's armor. Why? So you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And then after the battle, I love this, because he, he goes ahead and he tells us, hey, I'm going to go ahead and tell you the outcome of this battle. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. And I love that. 
Because he goes ahead and tells us the end of what the battle's going to be. We win. And then we come to our focal verses today in verses 14 and 15. He says this, stand your ground. Stand your ground. Put on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness for shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. We've already said it this morning, and I think it bears repeating, the battle of the mind. The battle is, it, it, of the mind is the most crucial of all battles. And it is important that we put on our armor. And so last week, just to review, we acknowledge that we're in a battle. That we have an enemy that we need a defense plan. And God's given us the defense plan right here. And then we know, we learned last week that our weapons aren't just normal weapons. They have the power of God that we use against our enemy. But I got to be really honest with you. The last two weeks has not been very fun for me. I shared with you last week that storms rolled through and uh, lost electricity, all first world issues, of course. But hey, it was real to me at that moment. And uh, as some of you were without electricity, and I was so looking forward to this week, I was changing up my schedule so I could do some things a little bit different up here and uh, put some more time in and study and, and a little bit of work. And I was on the treadmill last Monday morning, and I got a phone call that a 30-year friend that I talked or text almost every day had not woken up and had died. And I got to be honest with you. It was a sucker punch. I ugly cried, and I'm not going to do that here. Um, but you know, <laughs> sometimes life does that, doesn't it? Sometimes life just kind of um, gut punches us. Or, or Danielle even said this last week, throat punches us. And I, I know that some of you feel that. And, and I'll be real honest with you. The virus thing has not done that for me. It has not been a sucker punch for me. It has not been one of those things that's taken me out. In fact, I've learned to feel safe, just as safe in battle as I do in bed. In fact, God has a fixed time for my death. I, I'm not going to test him. Don't hear me saying that. But I'm telling you, I don't concern myself about my eventual death. I'm commanded to be ready, but from for I'm not going to worry about that. But for some of you, I've talked to some of you. And maybe you're listening this morning, and maybe you're listening this week. This has taken the wind out of you. It sucker punched you. You're scared. You're fear fearful of returning to life, whatever the new normal is going to be. And some of you, you're in this battle, and you're stuck. So how do we stand? I mean, Paul says to stand firm, right? He says that we will stand firm in the end if we follow our God. So how do we do that? Which brings me to the first thing we see in these two verses in Ephesians 6 is, number one, to stay on our feet or to get back on our feet means we pursue integrity. And the key word there is truth. It says stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth. Listen, the enemy, remember we have an enemy, loves it when Christians, Jesus followers, lack integrity and they vacillate between these things of what we think and what the truth is. And then he has to do very little to cause us to stumble or fall. You see, biblical, biblical integrity is not just doing the right thing. It's a matter of having the right heart and allowing the person you are on the inside match the person you are on the outside. In other words, it's what taking those principles, those things that we believe and we know about God, we take those things that we believe on the inside and we let that be a reflection on the outside. It's the same inside and out. And for so many of us, we are lacking biblical integrity because we know truths, but yet we live our lives in fear. And that's why I think Paul says, put on this belt of truth, because that's how God is. God is the same inside as his actions outside. He's consistent. And I think that's a good word, that there's got to be consistency by, between what is inside and what is outside. And honestly, that's tested us, some of us, during this season. That's tested us this week, that God is totally consistent. His actions and behaviors always match his character and his nature. He says to fear not. He says, peace I leave you. 
And whether I feel it or not, just what we were just singing, whether I feel it or not, it's still the principle of his truth of who he is. Because I don't have to believe it for it to be true. It's true, so therefore I lean into that until I feel it. And some of us have quit leaning into those principles when we live with and by integrity, the inside matches the outside. And that gives us clear options. It kind of clears things up. Not just right and wrong decisions versus good and best decisions. Because I think there's a whole lot of freedom in walking with Christ between good and best. But when it comes to right or wrong, all of a sudden when we're living by truth and taking those principles that never change, that God never changes, he's always consistent, then it gives us clear options of knowing how to respond. In the sinful world we live in today, the truth is our integrity is imperfect because perfect integrity can only be found in Jesus. And through him, we're able to aim towards true integrity for ourselves, which brings me to the second point in this passage, with that, that if we're going to stay on our feet and we're going to get back on our feet, then we are di to display the righteousness of Christ. The key word here is Holiness to be set apart from the ways of the world. Look what verse 14 says. Stand your ground, put on the belt of truth, and the body armor of God's righteousness. Now listen to me for a moment. I want to teach this for you because so you understand this. Because this is the point. Justification is that step in salvation in which God declares you and I righteous. That at the moment of salvation, at the moment of, that we believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, at that moment, the full credit of Christ's righteousness is on us. There are many out there that believe, Roman Catholics for one, that they don't believe in the full imputation of God's righteousness in us at salvation. They believe in what's called infused righteousness, that, that you are given some, but then you have to work for the rest of it. Listen, it is by faith alone that you are saved, not by any works you do. And at that moment, he imputes all of Christ's righteousness on us, every bit of it. We don't have to work, to earn, to strive, or anything else. We just have to put it on and enjoy it, to walk in that and display that. The righteousness is not our own because there's nothing good in us. But we've been imputed or given or credited like a, like a banking account has been credited and you had nothing to do with it. You see, I think what's happened for many of us that's kind of brought back this whole idea. For a long time, the church has lost this whole idea of what it means to be lost. To be lost. And this idea of sinfulness and the need for salvation and righteousness. We got comfortable of teaching self-help and feel good messages that never had a need for righteousness or holiness. And while I love a good, feel good sermon and, and, and building me up and helping me make good decisions, I just gotta tell you that, 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 that I've got to be reminded and I'm more reminded now than I probably have been in a while now is that I am broken and I have a dire need for a savior. It's Jesus, because we're sinners. Our sin has separated us from God, and it doesn't take long to look around and see the world is groaning under sin. It doesn't take long to look out that we have been separated from a righteous and holy God, and the only way we're made right is when we surrender our life and our will to God through Jesus Christ's sacrifice, and we're saved and made new. That's it. The holiness of God is the standard for us to take on his holiness. And listen, I'll tell you this, an encounter with holiness is traumatic. It changes your life. When you have an encounter with a holy God, it changes your life. One of my favorite stories is in John chapter 18 when Jesus is about to be arrested and they're in the garden and Judas has already betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ and they come and they approach him in the garden. Judas comes and kisses him on the cheek and, and they realize it's him and the Roman soldiers, there were 600 Roman soldiers that showed up to take Jesus. A little bit of overreaction there, but you're fixing to see what happens. They're, 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 it, what amazes is when they ask 
ask him the question, are you Jesus? Are you he? He said, yes, I am he. And, and the structure of that word says that when he said that, that all 600 soldiers didn't just fall down, but was pushed back and pinned to the ground. Wow. Just in that moment, as the veil was pulled up, so to speak, and his holiness was exposed, the men that came to arrest Jesus got arrested by the holiness of God because that's what it'll do to you. It'll arrest you. It'll change you. And that's ours, believers, that righteousness that we've been made perfect and it's not ours because we don't have it. We are a lost, broken people. Without the Savior, we are still lost and broken. But because of what he did, he has arrested us and pinned us to the ground, just like those 600 soldiers. And it changes you. And Paul says, put on that righteousness. Put on that. Because you see, when we put on that and we acknowledge that we need Christ to display Christ, if the world ever needs a display of the Savior, it's today that we would display Jesus Christ to a lost world, a hurting world, a dark world, people who thought they had it together and now are going, what in the world happened? They've been dropped in a jungle in the middle of South America, and we've been called to be a display of the righteousness of Christ. Which brings me to my third thing. Because we talk about the holiness. It means to be set apart. It means to be set apart in the ways of the world. Because the ways of the world are greedy, selfish, fearful, hateful, divisive. Let's go hide. Let's go fight. He says to be set apart. And so he says in verse 15 that when we're standing, remember we're going to be standing at the end. See verse 13. Don't miss that. Don't forget that. But we and we are standing in life. We are to stand with confidence. And here's the key word, peace. Listen, I can stand before you today and I can tell you, I don't know what the future holds, but I didn't know what the future held last year. But I'm at peace. And that's the difference for some of you that are listening this morning, is you're not at peace. You see, Paul goes on to say, verse 15, for shoes. Shoes are pretty stinking important, amen? But on the, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. You see, this shouldn't have surprised us if we were putting on what he's already given us for the battle. Peace is something we desperately need and desire. But what is it and how do we get it? Paul says here that it comes from the good news. So what's the good news? Well, listen to me. I'm glad you asked. Because the good news is that Jesus has come and whoever believes in the name of Jesus Christ will be saved. You'll be saved. Not believe on the denomination. Not to believe on a civic group. Not to believe in America. The name of of the Lord Jesus Christ saves us. The good news is Jesus came and he took our sin and he died on the cross. And if we will surrender our lives to him, we'll be saved. Listen, we're broken, we're sinful, and we're in need of someone to save us and guide us. And I'm convinced that the only answer to the problem of evil and suffering and brokenness is a person. His name is Jesus. In fact, 1 Timothy 1.15 says this is a trustworthy saying. You can trust this. In fact, some of you need to kind of lean into this because if you lean into this, you might just find out it's trustworthy. Paul says this is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. And let me go ahead and confess it. Of just a few folks that are sitting in this room and you that are watching, guess what? I'm the chief among sinners. I'm the chief among all of you. You see, I know some of you. You don't believe or you stop believing. And yet you still know that the world is broken. And if you were really honest, you feel separation in this world. You feel broken. That's why the gospel is such good news because he wants to save us. And you see, some of you have disbelieved or stopped believing or never believed along, but you're listening in. And I'm so glad you are because we love you. 
But listen to me. Some of you have blamed the church. You've blamed guys like me. You've blamed your mama. You've blamed sickness. How could a good God ever? And all those things that we say, and yet today you know there's not peace in your heart. You know that you are dependent, but you're trying to depend on yourselves. And I would encourage you, listen to me, I would encourage you, don't take another look at me because I'm the chief among sinners. Take a good look at Jesus. Take a good look at Jesus again. I love what John 14, 27 says. It's on our sign if you drive by. It says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I don't give to you as the world gives. The world's going to tell you to go buy more toilet paper. The world's going to tell you to go buy more hand sanitizer. Stock up on Lysol. Do all that. And listen, you need toilet paper, amen, and you need hand sanitizer, and you need that stuff. But listen, Jesus says, the peace I give you is not what the world gives you. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. I'm telling you, that's where my peace is. It's in him, Romans 5, 1 through 2. I love this. It says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight, remember, his righteousness has made us right in his sight. We have all the righteousness of Jesus in us, on us, around us. It, he's filled us. We have now been made right with God. Look what he says, that, that we've been made right in God's sight by faith. Now, we're going to talk about that. We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Because of our faith, there it is again, Christ has brought us into the place of undeserved privilege, unmerited grace, amen, where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Listen, before you place your trust in Jesus Christ, and some of you, this is where you are, you're not right with God. I don't care if you have a deal with God. I have so many men tell me on their deathbeds, well, maybe God got a deal. Listen, the only deal God has is Jesus. That's it. So if you don't have your faith in Jesus, then you're not right with God. You don't have peace with him. You don't walk in spiritual confidence and joy, and you, you don't look forward to sharing in his glory. But once you begin a relationship with Jesus, and can I just say this? It's by faith. Some of you are looking for something concrete, grab on, like a chair. It's faith, man. It's faith. That's when God executes his promises to our lives. He makes us right with him. He declares us right with him between us and him. He makes peace with us on the basis of what he's done for us. He brings us into a place of privilege, and that's all his work. All we have to do is merely by faith believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at that moment, I can't explain it to you. I can only tell you that a peace that passes all understanding takes up residence in your life. And see, some of you tasted that years ago, but you have disbelieved or you've unbelieved, and you know what it tastes like. And now you're working harder than ever to make sure that, that everybody knows you don't believe. But listen to me. You know what it feels like. You know what it tastes like. The psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You've tasted that, and some of you need to come back and repent and believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and come home, to come home. See, it's so important that when we accept him by faith, that all condemnation ceases, and we're at peace. And all of a sudden, the future doesn't seem so scary. And I can be just as comfortable in battle as I am in bed, knowing that God has my future. I don't know the day of my impending death. I don't worry about it. I'm not going to test the Lord, okay? But I know he's got me, and I'm at peace. I don't have to worry about the economy. I don't have to worry about governments and world governments because God has that. You see, the gospel, peace, the shoes covering our path, that's our future. That's our future. And if we don't have our feet covered with the peace that God has our future, then we won't stand confidently. And anything that comes along will knock us off. You see, we stand on the good news that we need a Savior, and we need to be made right, and we need to receive peace. I don't fear my impending death. I'm going to die, and I know that. But I'm not worried about it. I'm not going to hole up in a cave somewhere because I have a mission that God sent me on. I'm in a battle. We are in a battle, church. We stand on the good news, knowing that a virus we don't even know about is coming. Because as soon as this one's over, there's another one. About every four years, do your research. It's coming. 
There's not one thing we can do about it now any more than we can do anything about the ones we know about except wash our hands and don't touch our face. I didn't know I touched my face this much. So we rest in the comfort of the one who does know the future. We'll talk more about that next week, that resting. You see, I ended last week's message that we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. We've already won. Paul's already given that to us to say that, listen, once you've fought, when you stand, we're going to stand. He's conquered sin, death, and the grave. He's conquered the enemy. So if you find yourself this morning on the ground and you just don't know what to do or you find yourself paralyzed in fear, you find yourself having been sucker punched this week, let me encourage you to do a couple of things. Number one, just admit you're broken. Just admit it. Just get honest before the Lord. And I want to confess to you, that's not easy. Remember we said pursue integrity? You can't have spiritual integrity until we admit we're broken. And listen to me. Listen to me. There's no confidence in the holy of God to protect me and lead us if I'm not willing to admit, admit I need him. I trust him. And I completely surrender to him. I can't be integrity until I realize I am broken and I need Jesus. And so do you. He loves you. Listen, I don't ever want to be cavalier or arrogant or self-reliant. I don't want to not heed doctor's wisdoms or, or trusted authorities. But at the end of the day, listen to me. At the end of the day, they are not the ones I need. They are not the ones I put my trust in. They're not the ones I surrender to for my peace and my future. It's Jesus and the Holy Spirit that lives in me that has me. And he has you. He has you, church. Don't be afraid. Admit you're broken. But number two, invite someone into your journey. And because, listen, this whole idea of we're social distancing and hiding out in our houses, it's not what we were built for. And we want to honor the Lord and we want to honor our authorities, but the enemy wants to isolate us, and that's where some of you are struggling. So you need to invite someone into your journey by telephone, by text. Get on the phone and talk to them. Invite them in. I love what James 5, 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. We're all facing battles. We need each other. And to be aware of your brokenness is one thing, but to do something about it is all another. See, I think you know you're broken, but what are you going to do about it? And I would encourage you to invite someone into your journey to invite them in. That's why we started talking about small groups last week, how important of having a small group of people around you so that you, when you do enter into the intensity of the battle, you're arm in arm with someone. You're not isolated so the enemy can easily pick you off. So invite someone in. And then the third thing I would ask is that you would admit you're broken, invite someone into your journey. And number three, this is incredible, ask God for truth, for wisdom. You know who truth is, don't you? John 14, 6 says, Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is our truth. He is our answer. He's always been our answer. During this season, I found great comfort in James chapter 1. Because James chapter 1 is talking about all the trials and tribulations that we go through. He says this. And this, is in, this is very interesting. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, Whenever you face trials of many, many kinds. So here we are again. It's not if you're going to have trials. James just goes ahead and says, hey, we're going to face many kinds of trials. This isn't the last one. Listen, if you're not in a trial right now and everything's just hunky-dory in your life, amen. Be patient. It's coming. And some of you are right in the middle of it. And you're paralyzed. You won't even leave your house. Listen, James says this. Trials will test our faith. Do we trust man or God? Hello? See, the question is, do we trust ourselves or something else, or do we trust our God? Do we trust him? He goes on and says that the testing of our faith, look at it, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. See, these times are going to bring maturity. It's going to bring completeness in us if we place our trust in the one who's been faithful, and his name is Jesus. 
And then in verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, this is so awesome, just ask God. And look what he says, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it'll be given to you. See, some of us will listen to and ask every other source out there, social media, news, governments, your boss, your mama, your granddad, your uncle, and you'll believe anything that anybody writes on Facebook, that anybody writes on social media, and you're just as confused as the world out there that doesn't have the truth. You see, James is saying here, this is stunning. This is so astounding. James is simply saying, ask God. You can ask God. It's astounding. We can ask God, and look what he says, that God will give generously without finding fault, that he'll give us wisdom if we'll ask. Some of us have stopped asking, and we're trusting the media and the government and social media, your own intellect, because you know more than the doctors and you know more than the scientists. <laughs> There's some great suggestions coming from media and government. And we should be good Christians and follow and submit to authority unless they're asking us to abandon the faith, and they're not. The Constitution is not our living document. The Word of God is. And I know that's going to tick some of you off. But listen, I'm not playing anymore. This is a battle we're in. We've always been in a battle. We submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Lord. He's the King. He's given me a governing document for my life, and it supersedes any other document that any man can ever write. You see, all those other ones don't have our best interests in mind. There's only one, and his name is Jesus, that has our best interest in mind. And he's offering something to us. You can ask him for wisdom. This, every time I see that, it's stunning to me, and yet it's in the most encouraging thing I could see. He says, but when you ask, verse 6, you got to believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. you got to believe. You see, I believe that he's good, and I believe that he gives peace, and I believe that he saves me, and I believe that his righteousness is in me. And can I be honest with you? This last week, it hadn't felt that way, but I hadn't doubted him, and I'm leaning into him, and I'm going to continue to lean into him because, see, I think what's happened for some of us, we've quit leaning into that. We've asked. Oh, you've asked. I know some of you are begging God for this thing to go away, just like Paul begged it for, for his thorn in the flesh to go away. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you. And see, some of us are doubting. So here's my challenge for us this week. Would you join me this week and admit you're broken? It's the unmerited grace of God through Jesus Christ that we're saved. So go ahead and admit you're broken and invite someone into your journey. And lastly, ask God for truth. Lean into that. Even when you don't feel it, we just sang it a while ago, even when I don't see it, God, I know you're good and I know you got me. Let's pray together. Father, I love you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. And God, may you help us realize that we are a broken people that need a Savior. You are holy. You are set apart. God, you have set us apart for those of us who have believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, give us courage to ask someone to come along in our journey. And God, I pray this week you'd give us wisdom, wisdom beyond the world wisdom beyond anything we know. And we would enjoy you this week and be at peace. I love you. Thank you for Jesus. We ask it in his beautiful name. Amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to 
uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.